Man, that took a lot of effort to get to Children's Church there. Well, I hope you're all doing well this week. Uh, I don't know about for you, about if it's been this way for you, but for me, it's been a little bit of an anxious bit of a week as we've watched the progression of our nation. And I hope you have found your peace and your hope in the sovereignty of God. Scripture reminds us that he sets up thrones, he takes them down, he sets the boundaries of the nation according to his will. And our praise, our hope, our rejoicing is not found in who sits in the highest office of our nation. It's found in who sits unquestionably on the throne of the universe. And I hope this has been an encouragement to you this week if things maybe didn't go quite as you have expected. Well, as we begin this morning, uh, we are back in the book of Matthew to start off with. And as we begin, I want to share with you a, a, a video about a rather unusual viral internet star, Judge Frank Capiro. Uh, have any of you heard of him? Well, good. This will be new to you. And so uh, here's Judge uh, Frank Capiro, and I think he's from Providence, uh, Maryland, someplace like that. And so, but check it out. Oh, forgot to edit this part out. Sorry. Well, what you see displayed in this man's actions, I think, in part, is the idea of mercy. Here is a man who has every right to pass judgment, but instead he demonstrates compassion and responds not with the passing of judgment, but rather forgiving these people their crimes. Well, today, as I mentioned, we're back in Matthew chapter 5, and we're looking at the characteristics that define a person who's living under the rule and reign of Jesus Christ. And the next characteristic that Jesus mentions here is that of mercy. That of mercy. Now, uh, the first four Beatitudes that we looked at, uh, they deal very much in terms of our attitude and our interaction with God. But as uh, we move into these next attitudes and characteristics, they're now defining our interaction with those around us. And so, to once again get reacquainted, you know, last week we took a break with our child dedication service, but to get reacquainted with this passage here, let's go ahead and start in verse 3 and read down through verse 11 out of Matthew 5 this morning as we begin. It said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you 
and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Well, as we get started this morning, uh, let's humble our hearts and prepare our minds with a word of prayer. God, as we come before you this morning, Lord, we just want to thank you so much for your mercy and grace. Uh, Our ability to come together as a church family, our ability to know, to learn, to be changed into the image of your Son, very much rest on these two things and their presence in our life. Father, I pray that through your word today, we would better understand the mercy you have shown to us through Jesus Christ. And as we grow in our understanding of your mercy for us, may you create within us a heart and a conviction of demonstrating mercy to those around us. Father, I pray that we would be tender to those areas of life to which your truth needs to touch and transform, uh, that we would be humble, recognizing that we are broken and in need of your grace and your transformation. Father, I pray for your strength. I know in and of myself, so I do not have the tools uh, uh, necessary to do this task of preaching your word, but I know with your grace and your strength, you can use me to do your work this morning, and I pray for that very thing. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we begin this morning, we're looking at this idea of mercy. And mercy is one of those very important, very connected terms that we find in the Bible. Uh, It defines much of the other things and connects to much of the other things that we learn about in terms of the gospel. Now, mercy in the Greek, in its most basic form, it means to be compassionate, to be kind, to be sympathetic. If you're to look to the Old Testament, the Hebrew word that most closely associates with it is the Hebrew word hesed. And we've studied that word before. It means loving kindness, or, or sometimes it's translated steadfast love. And I think one of the best depictions of mercy is actually found in one of Jesus' parables. And we're going to go there and look so we can see mercy kind of illustrated for us. If you have your Bibles, look with me at Luke 10. And in this, we find the parable of the Good Samaritan. Many of you probably could recount this from memory here this morning, but uh, just for sake of reminder, we're going to go ahead and read through it. It says in verse 30, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and he saw him and passed up by the other side. So likewise a Levite, he came in, uh, to the place, saw him, and passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. And he went to him, and he bound up his wounds, pouring, oil and, uh, pouring on oil and wine. He then set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. So as we look at this story here, we see a man who is traveling. uh, Some guys jump him, beat him, rob him, and leave him half dead in a ditch. And we get this idea that unless somebody comes along and helps this guy, he is going to die in that ditch where he's been left. And the story says there are two people that come by, a priest and a Levite. They see him, they acknowledge his need, but they choose to ignore him and pass on by. The final traveler comes by, he sees him, beaten, robbed, dying in a ditch, and it says this, he has compassion on the situation that he's in, the pain that he's experiencing. Here you have the heart behind mercy. It is looking at the brokenness of a situation, looking at the need of an individual, and being moved by it. Now, the second part we see here is in the action that this man took. He didn't simply look at this man lying in the ditch and go, oh man, that's so bad. Somebody really needs to help him. He actually went down, picked up that man, began to bind his wounds, began to treat them with oils and wine. And not only that, He picked him up and he took him to a local inn and said, you know what, I want you to take care of this guy. I want you to get him back up on his feet. You know, here's some money to get you started. And if it costs you any more, you know, I'll come back and I'll pay the difference. 
And so we see another element here of sacrificial action. He saw that need. He was moved by it. He went to meet that need and then provided abundantly for it. You know, so mercy, as we look at it exemplified here in this, in this illustration that Jesus gives, it's seeing a problem, being moved by the pain, and then taking steps, if it's a sacrificial steps to rectify what is wrong. Now, what is so shocking about this illustration that Jesus gives here is that the man who's helping him is a Samaritan. Now, if you know anything about Samaritans and Jews, they did not get along with each other whatsoever. They hated each other. Jews, you know, because of some long history that I'm not going to get into, looked at Samaritans as half-breeds, you know, not true, authentic Jews. And so they treated them very, very poorly, and the Samaritans hated them back for the treatment that they'd received. If you wanted to bring it into maybe a modern illustration here, you know, and this might be too extreme, but you know, think of an ISIS soldier or an ISIS fighter uh, finding an American soldier wounded by himself and then taking that soldier, bringing him back to his own home and with his own resources helping bring this man back to health. You know, that's kind of maybe a simile we could, or a similarity we could strike between you know, today's culture and the culture that was being shared about in this parable. You know, the Samaritan should have looked at this Jew lying in the ditch and said, good, they deserve it for treating us the way they treat us. But instead, he sees this man suffering. The suffering of his enemy is moved by his pain and then takes sacrificial action to get him back up on his feet. That is the perfect picture of mercy right there. And if we were to put this illustration into words, it would be this that you see on the screen this morning. Mercy is seeing a problem, responding with genuine compassion, and taking sacrificial action to provide for that need. Now, each of us here this morning, we have experienced mercy. And we've experienced mercy through God and his sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Each of us today, we find our lives destroyed by sin. Jesus, as he uses this parable uh, of the Good Samaritan, what he's doing is he's helping the Pharisees understand what it means to truly love your neighbor. But if we were to put ourselves into this illustration, we wouldn't be the Good Samaritan. We would be the people lying in the ditch, broken, bloodied, and left for dead. And God, he looked at our hopeless, helpless state, and he was moved with compassion, and in mercy, he provided his son as the sacrifice for our sins to rescue us from sin and death. Paul lays it out so clearly for us in Titus 3, 5. You can turn there if you'd like with me this morning. We're going to reference this passage a couple of times as we continue to define and expound on mercy this morning. But it says here in verse 3, For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of the works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. You know, through Adam, we, uh, through the world, through Adam's rebellion, has been plunged into sin. And we each reflect Uh, the brokenness and the rebellion that defines all of humanity in the way we live our daily lives. You know, Titus says, uh, Paul and Titus says, we are foolish, thinking ourselves to be right when in fact we're dead wrong. We're disobedient, rejecting God's standard and replacing it with our own. We are slaves to our passion, being led along not by what pleases God, not by what what God desires, but, but what feels good to us. You know, we've been studying on Sunday night the fact that we are created in the image of God. We are created to bear the image of God here on earth. But sin has 
corrupted that image within us. It's like a house exposed to the weather. We're rotted both inside and out. And Paul says we're unable to fix ourselves. Good works cannot fix what sin has destroyed in our world and in our lives. It's like painting a rotted board. You can cover up the problem, but it doesn't change the nature uh, of that board. And so as we look at humanity, we see the devastation that rebellion and sin has caused. We see it in the broken families. We feel it in our own lives uh, as we make uh, un decisions that do not honor God and reap the consequences of them. But from the moment man first stepped into sin and began to bear the weight of his rebellion, God's mercy and God's compassion was present. In Genesis 3.15, God promised Eve, or when talking with Satan, uh, God promised that through Eve, he would bring someone into this world that would undo everything that the deception of Satan and the rebellion of man had brought. And that person we know to be Jesus Christ. Galatians 1.3 says this, Grace to you and peace from our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. God has provided us rescue from sin. God has provided us rescue from death, and he's done so through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Now, we're going to talk about a bit more as we connect mercy and justice together, how exactly God did that. But understand this, the rescue you need from the suffering sin has brought into your life is found in Jesus this morning. You know, there might be people out there who wonder, does God care about my suffering? Does God know and feel anything, uh, feel any compassion about the burdens that have captivated my heart? And the answer is yes, He does. He sees, He cares, and in His great love has mercifully provided us with salvation through Jesus Christ. And He calls upon you now to trust in Him, to make right in your life everything that sin and rebellion has made wrong. Friends, maybe you know somebody today in your life who who is just looking at the world, seeing everything going wrong, and wondering what's to be done about it. Friends, here's the wonderful message that God's mercy provides you to share with them. It's yes, God has seen, God has cared. You know, we deserve everything that we get as, uh, as rebellious people living in a broken world, but God didn't leave us to our destructive ways. God didn't leave us just to deal with the fallout both temporally and eternally uh, with our rebellion. He saw His suffering creation bearing the weight of sin and He provided in His mercy salvation. Now for those who have trusted in Christ this morning, you've experienced that mercy. And you've now been called by God to demonstrate that same mercy in the lives of others. To really understand this verse, you almost have to read it backwards. We don't show mercy to get mercy from God. We show mercy uh, as followers of Christ because we ourselves have received it. Now, you think of another parable that Jesus shared, the parable of the unforgiving servant in Matthew 18, 23-35. I'm not going to read it for you this morning, but let me summarize. Uh, Jesus, he gives this story about a man who owed a ton of money to one of the kings uh, of the area. And he was called in and uh, he said, all right, you owe me like $25 million. You got to pay it back and you got to pay it back now. And the guy said, I didn't have it uh, or I don't have it. And, And so the law said, if you can't pay your bill, you, your family and all your possessions get sold off as restitution. And the man pleaded with the king, please don't do that. And it says in, in this parable, the king out of pity on him. We see the elements of mercy here present in the attitudes of this king. Uh, out of pity for him, the master of the servant released him and forgave him the debt. Now, anyone familiar with this story knows that it's not the end of it right here. 
the same man who had been forgiven so much goes out and finds another guy who owes him really not that much, maybe like a hundred bucks in comparison to the millions that he owned. And he demands that he pays it back right there, right now. And the guy can't, so he throws him into jail. Now the king catches wind of this and hauls that servant back in and he asks him this question. It says in verse 32 of Luke 18, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should I not have had mercy? And should, and should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? Friends, we are to be the givers of mercy because we ourselves have been the recipients of an immeasurable amount of mercy. You know, I've heard people ask from time to time, when people reach out and care for them, uh, they ask this question, why would you do this for me? Why would you care for me? And the answer that we give back is quite simple as Christians. It's because somebody in the depth of our need cared for us, and that somebody was God through Jesus Christ. See, as we grow in our understanding of the gospel, and how it is so impacted in our life, so should we grow in our heart of mercy for the lives of those around us. Let me ask you, when you see people struggling in sin, when you see people bearing the weights of bad decisions, do you look at them and say, good, they're getting exactly what they deserve? Or do you look at them and say, you know what, that was me at one point before Jesus Christ came into my life, had mercy on me, provided for the depth of my need through his son, Jesus Christ. Now, I think we're really good at getting mercy. Where the struggle comes is at giving mercy. I mean, we give our mercy, ourselves mercy every single day, right? How many of you get to the end of a day and have not accomplished everything you had planned? Uh, that happens almost every day, right? And what do you do at the end of the day? You give yourself mercy, right? You say, well, there's some things that came up. You know, I tried my very hardest. You know, there are all these different reasons. And, you know, we cut ourselves a break. You say, you you know what, there's there's reasons I couldn't live up to the standard uh, that I had set for myself for this day. But when someone else doesn't live up to the standards we call for them, we immediately demand justice, right? How dare you? How could you? I demand that you get this right, right away. Well, as we look at the way God interacted with us and our failings, he had compassion. And our failings, he provided for our need where we could not measure up to his righteousness and his holiness by sending his son to be righteous for us, by sending his son to be the payment for our sins. And as we begin to see that, so should it define and change the way we interact with those around us. Now, this morning I want to take the concept of mercy and see how it connects uh, the different threads to other things that we see in the Bible, other concepts and actions we, re- we, um, we see in the Bible this morning. And the first concept I want to connect us with is that of love. Uh, mercy flows out of love. Uh, there's this little chart. I'm going to show it to you for like five seconds, and then I'm going to make it disappear. I meant to uh, put it a few more times in our slides this morning, but You know, and it looks like it didn't quite line up. Some of my fonts are off there. But we start with love. Out of that flows mercy. From mercy flows forgiveness, and from forgiveness flows justice. And so this is kind of the progression we're going to go through this morning. But mercy, uh, first I want to connect it with love. Ephesians 2, 4 tells us, But God, being rich in mercy, why? Because of the great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, made us alive together with Christ. The love of God expresses itself in many different ways. But one of the primary ways in which we experience the love of God is through his expression of mercy in our life. And one of the ways that we are going to express love and the lives of those around us is by demonstrating the same mercy that we ourselves have received. Our love will be seen in how we acknowledge the needs of others, how we respond with genuine compassion, and how we engage in selfless care to help meet those needs. Your love is going to be seen as you provide help and guidance to the, to the 
couple struggling in their marriage. Your love is going to be seen as you move to provide for that person who had just lost their job and is going to struggle making it by for the next couple of months. Your love is going to be seen as you help someone recover from a bad decision that they made and get back up on their feet. You know, one ministry that I was talking about with the missions ministry team in our, in our community that would well define the idea of mercy is refuge. And the refuge ministry, they've got several different campuses, one in Lancaster and, and around, is a ministry geared to helping people overcome their substance abuse issues, their addictions to different substances. And that's a ministry, a group of people who have come alongside these individuals and say, yes, you've had some bad decisions. Yes, you are reaping the consequences of those bad decisions, but we're willing to help you take steps in a different direction. There is a need in your life. You need help to move in the right direction, and we're here to provide for that. Deuteronomy 15, 7 through 8, Jesus, not Jesus, God commands... um, the Israelite people, to demonstrate mercy in this way. It says in Deuteronomy 15, 7 through 8, If anyone among you, one of your brothers, should become poor, in any of your towns within your land that the Lord your God has given you, you shall not harden your heart or shut your hand against your poor brother, but you shall open your hand to him and lend him sufficient for his need, whatever it may be. And take care lest there be an unworthy thought in your heart. And you say, the seventh year, the year of release is near, and you and your eye look grudgingly on your poor brother, and you give him nothing. And he cry out to the Lord against you, and you be guilty of sin. You know, one of the ways that God commanded the Israelites to demonstrate his mercy in their interactions with one another is by seeing the needs physically that existed in each other's lives, having compassion on them, and then giving to those needs. And it talks about the seventh year here. There was a cycle in which God established that after a certain amount of time, the debts that were owed to were to be erased and not held against an individual anymore. And God was saying here, you know, maybe it's like year six and year seven is coming around the corner and you look at this person and go, you know what, I don't want to give them a loan and then not have them repay it or, 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 you know, give them help and, you know, uh, have to just erase it a little bit ago, a little bit, you know, after this. He says, no, you're to look at the need, you're to have compassion, and you're to provide for it sacrificially, if need be. And so the most basic level of mercy is helping people with their physical needs, but we must understand that there are emotional and spiritual needs that exist in their lives as well. Romans calls us to rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Uh, the most important need that we know that exists in the lives of an individual is a spiritual need. And the mercy of God should prompt within us this fervency for seeing that spiritual need, need met through the preaching of the gospel. Mercy should prompt within us uh, a faithful prayer life for the lost. It should move us with the words of healing and the words of salvation for those who are lost in their sin. We can in no ways claim to love people while ignoring their needs, both physically, emotionally, and most importantly, spiritually. If you want to show someone you'd love them, show mercy. See their suffering. Let God create within you a compassion for them and then serve their needs in the manner God has called and God has equipped. And so we see that out of love flows mercy. Uh, and next, out of mercy flows forgiveness. We read in Titus 3, 5 that it is in God's mercy he saves us and forgives us. You have the illustration uh, of washing through regeneration or the washing of regeneration. You know, one of the ways we will express love is in mercy, and one of the ways we will express mercy is in forgiving one another when we mess up, when we sin against one another. Mercy in our life is going to be seen in how we respond to the failures of those around us. Ephesians 4.32 says this, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ forgave you. You know, I think meekness 
breeds within us an attitude of mercy and forgiveness towards one another. We know what it is to mess up. We know what it is to have wronged another. And in fact, we have sinned, each of us, against the most important person that there is, God. Yet Christ, He forgave us. God, He no longer holds our sins against us. And when we look at that person who has sinned against us, in some senses, we should be looking in a mirror. And we should say, you know what, I know what it's like to be there. I know what it's like to have sinned against another uh, and be indebted to them because of it, because that was me one day before Jesus Christ. That was me before God washed my sins away through the blood of Jesus Christ. Now you might say, well, you don't know what they did to me. And I might not know what they did to you. I'll be honest, I've heard, uh, I've heard testimony of some terrible wrongs done on one, on the part of one person to another, the pain it's caused, the scars that is, is left. But what gives us the ability to forgive is not the measure of a person's sin, but the measure of the mercy we ourselves have been given. Friends, understand, our sin has offended an infinitely holy God. That is why the punishment for our rebellion is eternal, because we have rejected and disgraced an eternally holy God. Now, if God has forgiven our eternal offenses that we have committed against Him, how can we not forgive the finite offenses done against one another? You know, it is in the mercy of God that we find the strength and motive we need to forgive the sins of one another. So, a heart of love and a heart of mercy creates within us the willingness to look at another person and say, I forgive you. And I forgive you because I myself have been forgiven for great sins that I have done. And so as we continue on here, we see the qualities that define us. We see love, we see mercy, we see forgiveness. But now I want to connect forgiveness with justice this morning. You know, this is the more common definition of mercy. Us not getting what we deserve. Now, let me encourage you, that is not the whole definition of mercy. That's just mercy in its relationship uh, to, uh, to justice and uh, I don't even think that definition, mercy is not getting what we deserve, is really complete in and of itself. Uh, because here's how mercy and justice relate in terms of God's reaction to our sin. God did not show us mercy by ignoring our sins. God showed us mercy by sending Jesus to take the wrath and judgment that was meant for our sins. God responded to our sins, but he didn't do it by just turning a blind eye. He took all of the judgment, all of the punishment that was supposed to be for us, and he poured it out on Jesus instead. It says in 1 John 2, 2, But if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he was the propitiation, the payment, the satisfaction of God's wrath for our sins. And not only for ours, but for the sins of the whole world here. Jesus took the wrath that was meant for us and bore it on the cross. There's this story uh, about uh, Mayer. Uh, He was mayor uh, during uh, World War II, uh, 1935 kind of era. And what he would do is he would go around, and he was loved by the people of New York. He was mayor of New York. Um, I think it's like, uh, I can't remember, it's some Italian name. Uh, And I'm just going to butcher it if I try to pronounce it from memory. Uh, But he would go and he would serve different wards in some of the poorest parts of New York City. And one day he went in and uh, he went into a a judicial room and uh, he gave the judge the night off and he actually took the bench and began passing judgments. And during the evening, an older lady from one of the poorest parts of New York City was brought in and she was brought in by the storekeeper because she was caught stealing a loaf of bread. And the storekeeper demanded that justice be done. He said, it's a bad neighborhood, and this lady needs to be shown as a lesson. You know, uh, demonstrated that she's done wrong. 
you know. And so the mayor, he looked at this lady and said, yes, the law is the law. And the fine for your robbery is $10. And so he took out $10 and he paid her fine. But he didn't stop there. He went on to say, you know what? I'm also going to pronounce another sentence here. Anybody in this courtroom, I am charging them, I think it was like 50 cents or something like that, for having, making the city be such that an old lady has to steal bread in order to get by. And so he fined everybody else in that room that little amount, collected the fine, and the following day it was found out that uh, he had raised uh, $47.50 to then give to this old lady uh, and help her get by. But you know, I think that's a real good representation of what God as the judge did for us. We had sinned, the law was the law, the price had to be paid, but instead of having us pay for it, he sent his son, who fulfilled the law perfectly, obeyed the will of his father perfectly, and then suffered in our sakes, so that in his mercy he might forgive us. In his mercy he might redeem us. And so friends, let me encourage you. Here's what I want us to understand from this. Mercy does not ignore our sins. If you're ignoring personal sin or or another individual's sin and claiming to be merciful, you're not. Mercy rescues us from the consequence of our sin. And we can demonstrate mercy by speaking up in love and in grace and calling people out of their sin. We know from Scripture that sin only gives temporary pleasure, but in the end it leaves our lives in ruin. And when we see a person making life choices that do not honor God, that will only bring in the end pain and loss, mercy drives us to speak up and say, don't do that, don't go that direction. It is not what God promises to be best for us. How unloving, how unmerciful must we be to do otherwise? Disciplining my kids, in some senses, is an act of mercy. That momentary discipline I bring in their life is an attempt uh, on my part to keep them from making decisions that will bring so much more pain and loss in their life in the future. And so here's the caution I would bring to you this morning. Do not think that ignoring sin is mercy. And don't think that God is going to demonstrate mercy in your life by ignoring your sin either. He is going to show you mercy by calling you to repent of your sin and turn to Jesus Christ who was the propitiation, the satisfaction of God's wrath for your sin and trust in Him to be your redemption. Trust in Him to bring forgiveness and restoration with your Creator. And so friends, let me ask you, are you looking for mercy this morning? If you are, then turn to the cross. Look at the payment that was made on your behalf to rescue you from your sin, to lead you to repent, to turn away, and to be redeemed, to tra- and be transformed. Now, there's one other element here that I'm going to bring a connection to, uh, the uh, idea of, uh, of grace here. I'm a little behind on my PowerPoint. Mercy brings freedom from death. Oh, wait, no, I'm, I'm right where I'm supposed to be. I just need to read it. Uh, all right. Mercy and grace, yeah, they're closely related, but they're distinct. Yeah, I, I like to think of it as two sides of the same coin. Where you find mercy in the gospel, on the other side, you find grace there as well. You know, imagine a tree fell over on you. It, it crushed your leg, and you are stuck, unable to get yourself out. Mercy is me coming and removing that tree from your leg. Grace is bringing healing to that broken leg. Mercy relieves the pain. Grace brings healing to the problem. Mercy forgives us our sin and removes the consequences. Grace restores in us what sin took away. Grace says you shall not die. Or excuse me, mercy says you shall not die. Grace says you shall have eternal life. And so as we talk about mercy this morning, And as we bring it to bear uh, in terms of the gospel and the impact uh, that it's had on our life, we can't leave out the grace element as well. It's closely connected with it. And see, God has not simply forgiven your sins. 
God has not simply rescued you from sin and death. He has given you, by His grace, eternal life. And eternal life is not what we get when we get to heaven. It's not going and living for eternally for Him. It's a quality of life that we now begin to embrace by His grace. It's that restoration of the image of God that we were created to bear as daily through His Word and through His Spirit and through His Son, He transforms us back into His image. And so by His mercy, He rescues us from sin and death. And by His grace, He daily transforms us back into the image of His Son. It is in His grace that we find the riches that have been poured out on us through Jesus Christ. Now, there is so much more I could say about mercy. Honestly, I got to the end of the sermon. Uh, I was finishing up Friday morning and going, Man, I feel like I've talked about everything, but I've talked about nothing at the same time. There are entire books written on the singular idea of mercy. Uh, There was a a seven-part sermon series that I referenced on the singular idea of mercy. Uh, And all that to say is that what we've done here is a very quick summary. And my burden this morning was to define it and connect it with the other aspects of our life. But here's what Jesus comes and teaches us. That when we, by his, uh, but when we accept him as our Savior, he, by his grace, gives, he displays to us mercy. And by his mercy, creates in us a heart of mercy for one another. And, And friends, let me ask you, if people were to look at your life today, would this be one of the qualities they would define you by? Where they look at you and say, that is a merciful person. I'll be honest, this is probably one of these characteristics that I most need to become better acquainted with in my life. Uh, ones in which I need to better practice in my interaction with those around me. Because I'm not very compassionate. I'm really not. Uh, I look at people suffering from their sins and I go, good, they deserve it. They were stupid, you know, they're getting what they deserve. But as I look at what Christ did for me, it was dynamically different. He looked at me, saw the suffering and said, yes, he's getting what he deserves, but I'm going to provide him something greater. Uh, I'm not going to let Michael stay there in his sin, in his brokenness. I'm going to provide him forgiveness, rescue and redemption. Friends, do we have that same heart? As we look at the lost around us. Friends, do we want to let the world know that we love them? Do we want to let Baltimore, Pleasantville, Carroll, Pickerington, Thurston, Millersport know that we love them? Friends, let us act out in ways that demonstrate mercy. Let us be compassionate to the needs and the sufferings that exist in the lives around us and provide for those needs. And when people ask of us, why do you care for us and our suffering? May we answer with the gospel because somebody cared for me and responded and and acted uh, on the deepest need that existed in my life. Friends, maybe you need to engage in mercy by giving forgiveness this morning that you haven't been granted. Maybe there's bitterness you've held in your heart. And you need to say to yourself this morning, how can I not forgive the finite son, sin done son, oh boy, I'm going to eventually get it out, sin done against me after the infinite forgiveness I've received through Christ. Friends, let's end in prayer this morning. Father, as we come before you, Lord, just as a follower of you, I come and I ask that you'd help me better understand how to live out your mercy. Lord, as I preach this sermon, I realize that, yes, I understand the concept, I can define it, but, Lord, I need to work on my application so much more. I need to think deeply and radically about how this reality that I've experienced in and through your Son needs to now shape the way I think, shape the way I live. And, Father, I pray if there's someone here today who has heard this truth about your mercy and has been convicted in their life about the way they're acting or not acting, the way they are viewing others or not viewing others, that they would come before you as we close today, repent 
and to begin to live out this truth that you would now have define our lives, that would demonstrate the fact that we are people living under your rule and your reign this morning. Father, we love you. We pray for your grace. We pray for conviction. And we pray for transformation as we close this morning.